Typically, when we're doing unit testing or micro testing, we're doing example based testing. We say, here's an example set of inputs, and here's the expected output from those inputs in particular. And we'll try and come up with a bunch of different example inputs, maybe that uh, represent certain edge cases or scenarios that we want to ensure our code is tested for. Example based testing is great, but I want to look at an alternative to example based testing, which is property based testing. In property based testing, instead of giving our code specific inputs, we describe those inputs and the outputs, and then the testing library generates many examples and many different inputs. Often they're randomized so that we're going to get different inputs each time we run the tests. And we can actually test our code with a much wider variety of examples because we're not defining specific examples. We're just describing what those examples should look like. I think this type of testing was originally done in Haskell using the Quick Check library. JavaScript has a similar library called Fast Check, and we're going to take a look at how that could work today. Let's start with some example based tests. These are the typical unit tests that you might write. Now the little project we're working with here is a list parser. Essentially it takes a string and breaks it into an array on the spaces. So you can see when our input is one space two space three we get one two and three as the elements of the output array. And we also want to make sure we parse numbers so when we have a two in there as the second element it is actually parsed into the number two. These tests are currently passing. We have a very basic function here that just does a split and then map to parse parse the right values to integers. And if we run yarn test, we can see that currently all of these tests are passing. And so what we want to do is convert these tests from example based tests to property based tests. So we're going to use the fast check library for this. Now there's a lot of power in the fast check library. We're going to look at a tiny sliver of it today. If this is an interesting topic, we can definitely uh, do more in future videos. The fast check library gives us a couple of different pieces. The two main pieces are runners and arbitraries. Now the arbitrary is something that generates a particular value value, a value that you're going to use as an input. In the case of our first test here, we probably want three inputs because we're going to have a list of three items. We can use fc.string to describe the input that we want. We just want a string and we're going to have three of those eventually, but we can't really use the arbitraries on their own. We need two other pieces, which the fast check library calls the runners. One of them is going to be fc.property. fc.property is what converts an arbitrary into an actual value and then runs some type of checking function. So let's see how this might work. Let's pass fc.string to fc.property. I'm actually going to do it three times because we want to have three strings. And then the last argument here is going to be our callback function. And this callback function is where we actually run our assertions. Here I might expect my arguments to be string one, string two, and string three. Now notice that this is a strongly typed library. You can see that if I look at the type of string one, if I change this instead to be an integer, then you can see now that the type of string one is number instead of string. So let's roll that back to string. And in here, we can actually perform this test. So I'm going to move the existing test that we have up into our callback here. And now let's actually use our string one, string two, and string three values. So I'm going to change the input to use string one, string two, and string three. And now the output here should be string one, string two, and string three. So that is how we define our callback. And you can see that what we're doing is using the inputs that we have described. So we never actually have to choose examples for string one, string two, and string three. We can just essentially describe the behavior of our parse function. When these values are in these positions in our input, we expect them to be in these positions in our output. Now there's one more thing we need to do here, and that's wrap our call to FC property in a call to FC assert. So we just wrap this like this. FC assert is actually responsible for throwing an error or failing the test. FC property will convert our arbitraries into actual values and use them in this callback. This callback then needs to either throw an error, which is what we'll do in our expect statement, or alternatively, you could just return false if you wanted to do something outside of uh, the expect statement or some other assertion library. And then FC assert, if it sees either an error being thrown or the property callback returning false, it will then throw an error and fail the test. So what we have here is our very first property based test. We're describing our input as being three strings here, and then we have our test. So let's go ahead and run this with yarn test. And let's see what happens. Our tests are failing. And this is what a failed test from fast check looks like. Notice some interesting input here at the top. We can see, first of all, we have this description of what test was run. Because fast check wants to make sure to test a variety of inputs, it uses a different seed for its randomization each time you run it. So we can actually see what the seed here is, what the path, which I think just means the generation path for the tests as they are being generated. And then of course we can see end on failure is true, which is why this exited. And just more specifically, 
specifically, we can see what our counter example is here. We can see that string one and string three were both empty strings, and then string two was a space. And so this is why our tests have failed, because we didn't write our parser to take into account empty items or items that were just a single space. So when we get a failure like this, when we're doing property-based testing, we need to ask ourselves, is this a test case that I actually need to solve for, or should I be defining my properties a little more tightly? And in this case, when we have a list with either empty string items or space items, those are not things that we need to handle. And so we need to define our properties a little better. So let's come back to our code here and look at a couple of different ways to do that. FastCheck has several ways for us to tighten up the definition of a property. One of them is by adding a precondition. We can do this by calling fc.pre at the top of our callback here, and it expects one argument, which is a Boolean value. Now, if this precondition is true, then a failure will be considered an actual failure. But if the precondition is false, then we will ignore whatever failure happens in this test. So for example, we can say string one should not equal an empty string. And if we add this precondition, if the test fails, but our precondition is false, meaning that string one is an empty string, then that test failure will not be considered an actual failure. So if we run our test again here, we have a test failure, but string one here is not an empty string. Now it is a string with just a space, but it's not an empty string like our other ones here. There's actually probably a better way to do this, and that's by adding a config element here to our call to to fc.string. And what we can do is set the min length equal to one and we'll remove our precondition. Now this way, all of the strings will be at least one character long. Now that fixes the empty string problem, but it doesn't fix the string with white space problem. What's the best way to do that? We can create a regular expression to match white space. So I'm gonna put this at the top and call it regular expression white space. And this is just going to be very simple. It'll match any white space character. And so now to use this, we can actually filter on a particular arbitrary. So we can say dot filter off of our call to dot string, just like it's an array. And just like an array, we can pass in a predicate here. So we'll say this takes an item, of course, and then we can do re dot white space dot test the item to see if there's any white space in it. If there is, we want to exclude this item. So I'm going to negate that. And so we will only return true on items that do not have white space in them. So let's save this go ahead and run our test again. Now this should still fail in some cases because we're not doing this for items two and three, but we can see on the first item in our input here, we're no longer getting white space. Excellent. So what I can also do is copy this whole string property and mark it as a new thing, almost like alias set, no uh, white space. And now we've kind of defined our own arbitrary. So here I'm gonna say, make a call to no white space and actually we're going to do that for all three and the nice thing about this too our callback here is still getting strongly typed elements so there's really good typing in this fast check library if we run this again let's see what we get all right our tests are still failing oh but this is interesting notice what's happening this time we're getting a string here the third value which actually includes a digit in it and because of our second test, you'll remember our second test here is actually testing that we parse numbers within a list. That means that we're parsing that number. And so instead of getting a string, we're getting a number. Really, the other thing we want to do here is make sure that we filter out white space and digits. Uh, we could include the digits, but it's going to be easier to put that in a separate test. So I'm going to say no white space. Uh, actually, let's put this in square brackets here. And so we can match against any white space or digits. All right. And now if we run our test one more time, this time we can see that both our tests pass. And really what we care about is this first one, which is now a property based test is passing to convert the second one to a property based test as well should be pretty simple. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and copy our lines here for FC assert, paste that within the test. Instead of using our custom arbitrary for all three items in the array, we can replace one of them with FC.integer. And so in that case, this should still work the same. We're gonna put this, uh, maybe we can actually rename string here to, uh, we'll just call it num1, I guess. But now, uh, well, first of all, we can see we are strongly typed. We have our number here. Num1 in our input will be a string, so that's good. And then it will still be a number down here in our list expectation. So if we run this test, we should see that this passes. But now let's say we actually want to test for more than just integers. We also want to do floats. So we can change fc to fc.float. And now the test should work the same way, but it should actually fail now because as you can see, we're expecting a float value, but we only parse an integer. 
So now we can actually make a change to our code here. And this should be pretty straightforward. Instead of using parse int here, we can use parse float. And the rest of this should still work as expected. So let's go ahead and run these tests one more time. And there you go. We can see that now we're correctly parsing numbers. Maybe it's worth it to change this to ints and floats. There we go. So this has been a quick look at property-based testing with FastCheck. I've recently discovered this FastCheck library, so I'm just getting familiar with it. But if you've seen other really cool examples of how to use some of the power of FastCheck, I would love to hear about it. So be sure to drop a comment down below the like button. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.